Hi, in this lecture we'll be talking about portfolios and how you can use them in your classroom. So first off, what is a portfolio? A portfolio is a systematic collection of work and that word systematic has become really important. Um, a lot of what we'll be talking about today in this lecture is coming from this book by Dr. Bernie Kingor called Assessment Time-Saving Procedures for Busy Teachers. It's available from professional associates publishers if you're interested in learning more practical approaches to portfolios in addition to the chapter in the textbook about portfolio assessments. So we want to think about what are the purposes of portfolios. Um, they're to document readiness, um, to document achievement levels, usually specifically connected to a set of standards, um, or to document growth over time, um, thinking about growth portfolios. So the first question to consider is a student-managed versus teacher-managed portfolio system. So who is collecting and managing and keeping track of the portfolios? Um, who is responsible for that collection of materials, and thinking about that self-reflection component that would really be um, embolic of a student-managed portfolio system. A lot of times when we say we're doing a portfolio in a school, we're really talking about a teacher-managed system, but today we're going to talk a lot about the advantages of a more student-centered and student-managed approach to portfolios. Um, so when we're thinking about the kinds of port student portfolios, um, we can think about a yearly portfolio that's um, ongoing, very documenting learning achievements over the course of a year. It might include lots of different types of samples of items and quality of products. Um, a stu school career portfolio, this is usually typically managed by a teacher or a set of teachers, and it's usually one or two items per year that documents over time what a student has done. A lot of times we might, this might be part of a student's cumulative or cum folder, so it might include a writing sample each year. Um, that stays with them, sharing the work for next year's teacher. A lot of times we only see these if a student stays within one school or one school system. So if there's a lot of um, movement between schools or between school systems, we might not see a school career portfolio for a student. And then what we have is called a professional portfolio. This is very specific to a given context. So for example, you'll be putting together a professional portfolio during your internship. This really guided towards your experiences as a teacher. This is going to include things specific to that context. We also see professional portfolios in something like an art class. So you have a collection of your work. Um, and then there's a class portfolio. This might be um, a collection of work for an entire class. So thinking about what have we done, what are our collection of activities together that we've done, documenting that kind of learning and achievements that we've had as a community of, of learners. So let's talk about some guidelines for really effective use of portfolios. Um, it's authentically developed through daily activities. We're not doing things specifically for one por for a portfolio, but it's the collection of things we authentically do in our classroom. Um, but it's helping us make instructional decisions. Um, it's weaving that instruction and assessment together seamlessly, um, allowing students to revise their work over time, um, encouraging reflection and metacognition for increased learning gains, um, promoting challenge, originality, and complexity. Um, it also provides opportunities for that dialogue with a community of parents. Um, it's student-centered, um, providing motivation and engagement, um, and setting learning goals, hopefully connect to that motivation. So the first thing in our portfolio plan, so if we were going to create a plan for our portfolio, the first thing to think about is the purpose, purpose in the audience. This will guide the rest of our portfolio. So how will it benefit students, families, and teachers? I'm thinking about each audience separately and if each audience is important. Um, how will it help a student review past learning experience to guide future learning goals? So we'll, how will we think about um, setting that up in the classroom? Um, how does it correlate to school district or state standards and assessment requirements? So how can we incorporate those, those standards we know we have to meet in a classroom? Um, who will want or need to view that portfolio and how will we manage that? So if we want parents to be included, how is that going to happen? Are we going to send that portfolio home? And if we do, how will we get it back? Can it be a part of parent conferences or part of open houses or curriculum nights? How will we share this information with parents? Um, and how can they use to provide instructional feedback? 
So if I am a teacher and I have, you know, as an art teacher, I had, you know, eight, 900 students um, a year in my class, how can I use that da data to inform what I'm doing in the classroom that could be overwhelming? So how do I make sense of that data easily? The next thing I want to think about once I have a purpose is what are the products I'll include. So what curriculum areas? I always suggest that teachers start off with just one curriculum area. So if I'm an elementary school teacher teaching all content areas, maybe you just start off with writing or with math, not all of them. Um, what kind of products will best demonstrate that learning? So rather than collecting everything, thinking about a few key things, projects, writing samples, tests, or worksheets, what what am I going to collect that will best document the learning? Um, if I'm thinking about documenting learning through large or three-dimensional items, how can I manage that? You know, can I take pictures of it? Can I write written descriptions? How will I collect and think about these larger products? And this was really relevant to me as an art teacher. You know, I couldn't really keep their sculptures in a flat portfolio system. So how could I make that a part of what we were doing? Um, and how can I use this to support the ways that students learn? So if I do think that those products are important, um, how do I incorporate that into what we're doing? So next is who's selecting this work? Um, how can students be realistically and actively engaged in this process? Um, and when I did portfolios in my art room, I mean, I started in kindergarten. So kindergartners were actively involved in this process. I had to scaffold this a little bit with kinder, right? Um, but it's possible. So thinking about that process um, and how do I make that significant and appropriate for my students. How do I let them know this is how we'll select these products um, and what items should I require from them and how will they be included? How many? So the way this worked in my classroom as a teacher is we every nine weeks sat down and thought about this and they selected one in nine weeks. So it wasn't an overwhelming amount of pieces. Um, and we had that criteria worked out as a class. So we talked about things like visually appealing and craftsmanship, the neatness of the work, but also the process and the thought that went into it and the creativity the student showed. So it wasn't always what turned out the best, but it often represented the types of thinking that it went, went into it. And that was important to me as a teacher and to them as students. It was a co-created set of criteria that we selected. Um, and then how, yeah. So organization and management. Um, how can we how can we organize this so it's simple enough for students to be able to manage? We want this to be a process for them. If it's student centered, how can they access it? If the portfolios are stored behind my desk in a closet, is that a place where students are going to have access to it? Right? Probably not. Um, what containers are most appropriate? What kind of filing system will work? Where will they be stored? The kind of day-to-day -day mundane practicality of a portfolio system is important though to consider. And then assessment evaluation. How will we document what they've learned um, and provide that information to adults? Um, how can they be um, used to document learning objectives and state outcomes? So in my class, um, I literally, when I taught art, had, you know, a chart, a table of all of the standards for art. And then I just kind of checked off for each student when they've met those objectives in their portfolio. So I could see really easily on one sheet of paper where my students were and where I might be overall in a class missing some of these objectives. Um, and how do I involve students in doing this and making their own judgments? Um, and how do I help them say their growth and achievements? And how do I help them with their self-assessments and reflection? So in our next lecture, we'll talk a lot more about self-assessment, but thinking about this and then also with the students, how do I share that information with my administrators, with my principals, with my parents, and really thinking about the context of my school and how that could be worked out. Um, and then also how that supports a grade on a report card. And I'm really a big fan of using portfolios in teacher, student, parent conferences as, an, as a place and a way in which to engage with parents in the achievement that their students have done. So organization and management. So filing systems is probably the most basic way to keep a portfolio. And if we're collecting primarily things that fit on, you know, eight by 12 sheets of paper, then a hanging filing system works great. One file folder for each student, everything goes in there. When I was an art teacher, we used um, poster boards folded in half to, to keep their artwork and that their artwork fit in there very nicely. It was easy. I had a cubby hole for each class, so I got to keep their work and it worked out great. 
Um, if I had bigger work, I've had, I've seen teachers use, um, got pizza boxes donated for a class. I mean, unused, of course, with students' names on them, um, expanded files, um, shoe boxes, things that kind of made it easy for students to collect their work. I mean, now, obviously, digital portfolios are becoming more and more common. Um, flash drives, network drives are in, um, a nice way to manage work, and then it's um, unlimited storage space, virtually unlimited, right? So that can be an advantage um, where you're not worried about space. However, it can be a disadvantage because you want to think about um, management here in that if I, what can I easily look at? I can't visually think about all of this work, so I still want to be cognizant of having too much in that portfolio and still being selective about what's included, even if I am not limited by space. So product selection, I think this is maybe the most important idea here for when we're thinking about portfolios. A portfolio is a file, not a pile. We do not want to put every single thing a student does in a portfolio. Then it's not um, a selection of work. It's just everything, and it's hard to make sense of. We really want to think about what is the most important things, how am I selecting, and what's my purpose for putting something in. This collection, selection, and reflection should all be a piece of our portfolio system and really making it a part of a routine in a class. So every nine weeks, every one week, thinking about having a regular time in class where you're selecting items for their portfolio and you're providing an opportunity for students to reflect on why they're selecting specific pieces to go back into their portfolios. Um, everything should have a name, date, and some sort of reflective statement or caption along with it. This helps us keep us organized and, again, prevent us from having a pile and really making sure it's a file. And then thinking about selection by students and teachers. Um, primarily, I'm, I'm a big advocate of students selecting the work themselves and it, giving them that ownership and management of the portfolio. But, even, but teachers might need to put things in there occasionally. So as an art teacher, I was responsible for contests and, you know, putting a work up at City Hall or, you know, in the grocery store or whatever. And so I wanted to make sure that I had high quality pieces. So often, if a student didn't select a piece that I thought would look good for one of those displays, I often selected that for them as well and stuck that in their portfolio. So I would have it for later on as well. Um, and then having some sort of criteria charts developed by the student. Um, and it can be very simple um, to more complex. And the, having that co-creation with students is really helpful in having that buy-in. Using um, portfolios to document growth, um, having a learning and progress bulletin board, so having a place in your classroom where you're really celebrating what students are doing and how they're growing and what they're working on is, uh, I think, super beneficial. And also having repeated tasks, so, so collecting writing samples that are really similar over time can help students really see what they've done. Um, or having a similar task in art, I often have them draw a self-portrait throughout the year in different kind of contexts to help them see how they've grown in the skill of drawing. Um, and also audio or video recordings can also help do that, especially for thinking about something like fluency with reading. Um, having students listen to themselves read at the beginning of the year to the end of the year can be a really powerful way of showing them, wow, look at how much I've grown over this year. So this was a brief introduction to portfolios. Um, I hope that this was beneficial and has really helped you start to think about the ways in which you can use portfolios in your classroom. Um, I hope you have a great week. Bye.